Okay, can we have our two Bible readings, please? Thanks. Sorry about that. I wasn't aware of it, but never mind. Uh, page 1010 in the Church Bible for the first reading, Mark chapter 7, verse 24. The faith of a, of a Syrophoenician woman. Jesus left that place and, and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the, de the demon out of her daughter. <clears throat> First, let the children eat all they want, he told her. <clears throat> for it is not right to take the ch children's bread and toss it to, the, to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Here ends the reading. Okay, I just want to give thanks for um, Mike Jones, who will be leading the, the word, the, uh, the sermon this morning, and um, is coming all the way from St. Mary's, and uh, from our partner churches. And if you'd just like to stand up, I'd like to pray for you. And In fact, you might want to stretch out your hand to Mike, Lord, and it's not just from me, it's from the church. And so, Father God, we praise you for Mike and his ministry of St. Matthew, sorry, St. Mary's, and in Luton. And uh, I just pray that you may just bless him, Father God. We give thanks for the word you have given him. And we pray that you may fill him with your spirit. That he may speak the words that you've placed on his heart. And we pray also that you grant us a teachable spirit, Lord. That we will receive your word that we would be able to go home and meditate upon it. We pray that you may sow your word deeply into our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, yeah, it's good to be here. Um, as Dean says, my name's Mike. I'm the vicar of St. Mary's. I'm also the chair of Luton Town Centre Chaplaincy, actually. And so one thing I wanted to say um, is to say a thank you to you. I don't know if you're aware of what the chaplaincy does, um, but the chaplaincy really enables the churches to have a voice in the town centre and to be a listening ear. Um, and you may not be aware that you're one of the... There's not many churches in Luton that support us financially, and you might well be our biggest financial supporter, actually, and uh, we're very grateful for that. Um, as someone new, relatively new to the town... Um, my links to the town um, more around family than, uh, than around actually uh, living here. It is something quite notable about the town is the chaplaincy um, and actually you know there are over a thousand significant conversations that happen through that where people are people from who wouldn't normally darken the door of church um, talk to someone and, um, and conversations are had. So I um, really value your um, prayers for the chaplaincy, you're giving to the chaplaincy. Obviously you've got Helen, you've lent us Helen as well, who used to work for you uh, and now works uh, for us. And uh, so we're really grateful um, for that. But I don't really know what your uh, summer was like. Do you want to put the screen up? 
We'll see if the Kensington work. Uh, anyone get wet this summer? Yeah, this one's for you. I got absolutely <laughs> soaked. Uh, absolutely soaked this summer at, uh, at E-Wine and stuff. Um, uh, we had some real car troubles. Anyone have car troubles this summer? We drove to south of France. And uh, it wasn't great coming back. So if you did, this one's for you. So it can't have been as bad as that one. And uh, we, le we left our dog with uh, my sister. Sometimes we have animal troubles. We didn't. But anyone have animal troubles this summer? Yeah, okay, this one's for you. <laughs> that is big uh, trouble. <laughs> you really wonder what that guy is doing, doesn't he? He pretty much deserves it. Last week, we were on our way back from uh, Calais. And uh, we always go to City Europe, which is right by the terminal for um, the, the tunnel. And we drove, drove past the queues of the lorries. And we, you could see the migrants walking, and you could see the um, police vans going. Man, if people say the police aren't French, aren't doing anything, they really are. Their um, motorways have uh, chain fences going along them. And... Um, and this week, we've seen the tragedies on the shores and the stations of Europe, haven't we, as we've been uh, talking and uh, praying about it. And times have changed. In Europe, we used to be divided by a wall that stopped people leaving. And now we're building fences to stop people entering. Times have changed. We used to live in years where the USSR and the USA fought proxy wars between communism and capitalism all over the world. Now we're living in a world where Iran and Saudi, Sunni and Shia fight proxy wars all over the world and where Salafi Islam, that's a form of Islam that literally takes the Quran as the literal thing that must be implemented all over again. And of course, much of that is based on the Old Testament, uh, where those who, are, who follow a Salafic approach to Islam um, are engaging in war against so many others. Times have changed. Times have changed. People used to, we used to talk about people being shot, trying to escape East Germany, don't we? And now we talk about people being washed up on the European mainland. And times have changed. And I wonder what you see. I wonder what you think Britain should do. I've had questions around well, from J. John. Well, what should the church do? What should you do? For months, um, the Church of England, actually for years has been calling on European countries to take responsibility uh, for the problem that drives thousands of migrants to risk their lives in the Med. In May, uh, this one's reported, uh, Justin Welby said, when people are drowning in the Mediterranean, the need, the misery that has driven them out of their own countries is so extreme, so appalling, that Europe as a whole must rise up and seek to do what is right. And we are now letting some Syrians in. And that's right. And as I think it's sometimes good to remind us of where our faith comes from and where communion comes from and, um, and, and the deepest roots of that. And unusually, I'm quoting someone who I almost never quote from, but that's Giles Fraser. But he wrote this just Friday um, in a newspaper. He wrote this. The moral imagination of the Hebrew Scriptures was determined by battered refugee people think political oppression in North Africa and seeking a life for themselves safe from violence and from poverty time and again the books of the Hebrew scriptures remind its readers not to forget that they too were once in this situation and their way of life must be structured around practical help driven by fellow feeling the Passover was first celebrated as a last-minute preparation for as refugees fled Europe. And it's unleavened bread, traditionally used, because, of course, they didn't have time uh, for the yeast to make it rise. And when the author of Matthew's Gospel describes Jesus as a child refugee 
fleeing his country from a despotic ruler, intent on taking his life. Herod, that is, not Assad. He's deliberately sampling that basic story of the Exodus. And we need to do what is right. And the, today's passage actually takes us to the heart of it. It's a day when Jesus meets foreigners and meets them at their point of need. And there are two complementary things uh, that emerge from this passage. And depending on who we are, we're likely to focus in on one of the two. Uh, and I want us to see both. If you could just, for a moment, look at that picture. It's a classic, this one. Uh, just look at it for a moment. What do you see? Okay. Who sees a saxophonist playing? And who sees a woman? Okay. Okay, now you see both. We naturally see one or the other, and when pointed out, we see both. But we naturally see one or the other. How about that? What do you see? It's a bike. Have you seen this one? This is a, um, just a, a, a bike in the street. But of course, it depends on your perspective. Because it actually looks like that. It's like that. And then it's like that. Both are true. And both are seen from different places. And that's, we're going to look at two complementary views that we're likely to see on the, pas on the passages um, that we've read and are going to read. The point is that Jesus does not define you by where you come from. He doesn't hold your past against you. He doesn't hold your visa in his hands. Today, we define people by where they come from. If you're from country A, you're an economic migrant. If you're from country B, you're an asylum seeker. If you're from country C, you're a Brit. But you could be the same person coming from A, B, or C. Within my own family, I've got someone who can't live in our country just because of the country that he comes from. It's his own fault, but still, he didn't do his paperwork right. We define people by their geography, and we also define them by their age, their agenda. Some of us, the color of our skin. And women and children are seen differently. They're reported differently as they come out of the waves, as they do a man who comes out of the sea alive or dead. But the thing is, it was similar in Jesus' time. In Jesus' time, geography, uh, gender, and generation were thought to determine who you are even more than it does now. See, where you came from, what sex you were, what father you had, was thought to fix your personality. And you were born with it, and you were stuck with it. And now we're going to look at two passages. It was actually, the reading was seven uh, chapter, it was a very long reading you gave me. I'd be very grateful if it, if it, would be, if it had stopped uh, at verse 30. But actually, there's two uh, passages we're going to look at, um, chapter 7, 24 to the end. And I want us to look at that with this in mind, because the passage addresses what we're doing. If you would like to open your Bibles, that's great. Page 1010, if you're on the same way as me. And a couple of maps are going to be um, on the screen. Um, because actually, the maps help us. Because otherwise, I, I, if you're like me, I just forget how, where everything is. And actually, where everything is in Mark is quite important. Now, Mark often puts passages next to each other for a reason. Okay? You'll take one passage and you'll put another one. And it's like compare and contrast. I'm not going to do that because we've had a bit of time thinking about the refugee stuff. But we could compare and to contrast the two passages you gave me. The first one was the faith of the Syrophoenician woman. Um, we've just had that read. Thank you very much for that. And um, she comes, daughter's demonized, and is delivered. The second passage is the healing of a deaf and mute man, which I'm going to read to you. Um, he's actually in, uh, see, you see the top left-hand corner up there? You've got Galilee in the middle. That's Jesus' home area. He likes being there. And then up left is Tyre, and down right is, is the Decapolis. And uh, the healing of the the child was in Tyre, and then Jesus goes to the Decapolis down there 
And this is the reading. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre, that's the top left-hand corner, and went through Sidon, that's a bit higher up, but I haven't shown you that, and then he loops down to the Sea of Galilee, do you see that just below the yellow galley, the bit in the middle of everything? He goes down the Sea of Galilee into the region of the Decapolis. They were Greeks, they didn't like the Decapolis very much. But Jesus goes there. And there some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. And he took him aside, away from the crowd. Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. He spat and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephapha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He's done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So there's these two stories of two unfashionable places. Okay. Up to now, Jesus has mostly been ministering in Galilee. Do you see that bit um, in, in, in the yellow? It's also an unfashionable place, because the fashionable place is down the bottom, called Jerusalem okay, and Judea. And that's the fashionable part. In the middle, you remember the story of, of the Good Samaritan? That's the bit in the middle. And then above comes Galilee. Now, Jesus has mostly been ministering in Galilee, but opposition comes from Jerusalem. So when you sit here, the thing, or or people came from Jerusalem and were moaning, they'd actually made quite a journey up there, because he's up in Galilee. And Jesus has been teaching Galilee, and if if you look in the the, um, passages, um, people have come um, just earlier, in chapter 7, the the previous chapter, page 1010, you see Pharisees have come from Jerusalem, verse 1, And they've been giving him a hard time. Come on a special trip to kind of check him out, which is what they were supposed to do. So if someone came, they're supposed to be sorry. They're supposed to check him out, give him a bit of time, and then decide, is he right or wrong, and question him. So they were actually doing what they were supposed to be doing, but they got their answers wrong. And so what happens, he's had a bit of a rough time, and so in Mark's sequence, he then goes up, up left to Tyre, and down right to the Decapolis. Uh, Tyre was dead unpopular. It was well off. It's a port, it's Roman. They had money, and that might be why Jesus is so rude to this Syrophoenician woman. Matthew tells you she's Canaanite, right? So she's foreign, she speaks Greek. She lives in a town he doesn't like. She's Canaanite, which is a religion um, that that was not popular. And, And what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus breaks the cultural norms and he speaks to this woman. He's not a good, she's not a good Jewish religious woman, and he speaks to her, okay? And her child is demonized, which means that actually um, she wouldn't be regarded very well at all. And he steps into her world, which many around wouldn't. And then secondly, the deaf dumb guy, Decapolis, I speak Greek, that just means Deca is ten, and polis is cities. It's, it's the ten Cities, and it was like this group of ten Greek cities. Um, so they're foreign, uh, and, and they didn't like uh, foreigners that much. Um, but Jesus goes down to the ten cities. Um, the guy could well be Jewish, okay, that, that is healed because of what happens. But Jesus deals with this guy in the Decapolis as a human being. And that's almost the first thing that we need to pick up from the passage that Jesus. Uh, works with people who are completely unlike him and doesn't just go, oh, that foreign, what's it? He, he, he deals with them as people. He's pretty rude, actually, to the Syrophoenician woman, but he still um, treats her as a woman. And Christianity picks up on that as a key um, doctrine, a key understanding, a key thing, is, is actually that everybody is made in the image of God. And so, the, so we pick up on that. People deserve dignity because everyone is made in the image of God. Sometimes people make a bit of a mistake and say, everybody's a child of God. Actually, the Bible never tells you that. It's when you're adopted by God, you become a child of God. But we're all made in the image of God. Okay, and sometimes we make a variety of mistakes. Some of the mistakes are to say, oh, the church are the children of God. Therefore, we don't, want, we don't need to worry about others because they're not the children of God. 
But actually, the, uh, Jesus would show us, and the Bible would teach us, and theology would help us to understand that no, actually, everybody's made in the image of God. So that everyone owes, has a dignity, and God cares uh, for all people. And what does that mean? Well, when news, newspapers and parties make headlines that demonize uh, people, you know, the benefit scroungers, the, the foreigners in our midst. I've been a foreigner, by the way, living in another country, uh, just so that you're aware. I've had a knife put to my throat because of my ethnicity. Um, in the country I used to live in, I used to say, hi, my name is Mike, I'm harsh, well, half Welsh born in Cyprus. I learned to neglect the fact that I was English because of the reaction that I've had. So I understand if, you get, if you've had a rubbish time because of who you are. But Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't give a rubbish time because of who people are. So the first way that we can look at that, this passage, is that Jesus sees with compassion. Okay? So we've, we've, we've heard about that walk um, f- for someone whose leg, you know, has got that injury. Um, and that compassion for someone we may not know is, is, an, is a part of who God is. And that's one thing that we might see from this passage. Because, you know, Jesus steps, goes to the Decapolis, those ten cities, not a fashionable place, not a place a good Jewish boy would go. He's gone there, and he's engaged with the people around them. And he's engaged with someone who's going to be poor. If you're deaf and mute, you're going to live on the street, or unless you're, you're brought into someone's household. You're going to have a really hard time. But then the second thing that we could look at, and, and some of us may have noticed, whoop, um, is, is this other, so is um, what Jesus actually does. Because some of us are so good at seeing and having compassion, we don't actually notice how radical Jesus is. Because he actually um, heals a um, deaf guy who can suddenly speak. He doesn't just go, oh, bless him. How can I help him? How can I do stuff for him? He actually prays for, he prays for the guy um, and he heals him. And then um, with the girl, what's astonishing about the girl is the authority Jesus has. Um, actually, I'm quite used to understandings of deliverance and stuff like that. But actually, Jesus just goes, oh, she's been set free. And I've only ever seen that happen in worship somewhere where someone hasn't had to do anything but people are set free in worship never seen anything like what Jesus did where he just goes oh yeah she's sorted at home and she goes back and she finds her her child is, is delivered on her bed it is simp- the apparent Jesus is simply astonishing and even if you're from a tradition that goes yeah we're used to that maybe there's some of you Pentecostal here or from a charismatic moment yeah we're used to that actually this is way beyond anything um, that you'll um, ever see but the point is that God does heal Never forget the first guy I saw uh, healed of healed to some degree of deafness. Um, it was with a group. I didn't really. I wasn't the person leading the praying, and we, and we prayed for this guy. And he's like, "Oh, my hearing's improved," and I couldn't quite believe it. It was at a conference. I found the guy the next day. I really did find the guy the next day, and went back to him and went, "Look, were you just being nice when you said you, you know your hearing had improved just to get rid of everybody?" No, he was like, "No, it's like it really has improved." And I was at uh, one place once where there were about 30 vicars and archdeacons and that kind of people. It was a kind of, um, it, it, was kind, it was just one of those places. And, and some guy had come, his, um, it doesn't matter who, um, and he prayed for people's deafness. And the next morning they were testing me, like, this morning I was woken up. I wasn't pleased to be woken up. But I realized I'd been woken up by the rain on the roof. That was amazing, because I hadn't heard rain on the roof for years. 30 people were healed of deafness that day. To some extent, not total healing, but that God's power had worked. And then again, if you meet people who've experienced the deliverance of God, um, actually deliver, deliverance when people are oppressed, we don't tend to see people in this country that we notice who are totally taken over, but when people are, are oppressed, it's often one of the simplest things that happens, and people's lives, you see things changing in people's lives when um, the authority of Jesus comes in and their lives are changed. Now some of us struggle to, um, to, to cope with that first part of the, of the passage, the bit about everyone is made in, in the image of God, therefore we have to care. 
because we say, no, it's, it's all about saving souls. That one of those songs had saving souls. But actually, the, the, the Bible doesn't go for saving souls. It's about the whole person. Because actually, we have eternal life now, but our bodies are resurrected. We don't go and get eternal life. Eternal life, biblically, has started. That's what the Bible teaches you. And then the Bible says, and we will be with him on the day of the resurrection. It's not that eternal life we're going to go to and somehow our souls are going there. The Bible teaches that eternal life is now. And we're experiencing some of that now. And then our bodies will be resurrected. And those of us with aches and pains will be very glad that it's a resurrected body. It's not the same one that we've got now. So some of us struggle with the image of God part. Because we say it's all about the prayer and it's all about the healing. It's all about the deliverance. I don't have time for that care stuff. Someone else should do it. And then another part of the church says, no, it's all about the care. You know, there's so much justice in the Old Testament. You know, it, it, there's so much of that. You know, you know, that other stuff, I just don't believe in it. I tried it. It's just hard work. I, you know, they used to believe in it. And now we believe in science and we, we care and we don't do that stuff. Actually, Jesus did both. Um, and as a church, you've got a rich calling. Um, I've known Martin, I've known Simon and Debbie, trained with Simon and Debbie, actually, those of you who were the desks at All Nations in the ni- early 90s, late 80s. You know, and, and, and what God calls us to, to have is to be a people, to be a church that cares for the community, that actually is known for your care, is known for your love, but also to be a church that's known that's where God is. Not that we talk about God only, but actually that's where God is. And when if somehow that's your calling, and if you can bring those two things together, that's when God works. Um, and that's where God works all over the world. Um, you know, we know quite a few um, people working with Muslims, or we've seen Muslims come to faith. When Muslims come to faith, there are three things going to be present, and two of them will have been there. There's three factors that lead Muslims to come to faith, and there's um, generally two of the three will be there. One won't be enough. Uh, one factor is the Bible. Someone's given them the scripture. One factor is sacrificial love, where Christians cared for them. And one factor is the supernatural action of God, where God has appeared in a dream, or there's been a healing. Um, those are the three. The Bible, sacrificial love, and the supernatural of God. Well, this morning, we've preached from the Bible, talked about the love, and talked about the healing. And what they say is, the, the, what's called meta-research, which you get all the research on how people come to faith, and you say, well, what, how does it all add together? It says that you need two of those three. Say, the supernatural action of God and sacrificial love, or the Bible and sacrificial love. And I think that's a pretty good thing for, us, for you as a church, to say, actually... You know, we need God's word, we need the compassion of God, and we need to see the power of God. And what I'd like us to do is I just, we're going to receive communion. Um, it's 5 to 12, so would you like me to do it in a slightly shorter way than sometimes? Yeah, okay, we'll do that with your permission, we'll do that. So that if we're going to do that, if you'd like to stand with me for a minute, we're just going to ask God to touch our lives. This isn't a moment to pray out loud. I, I like that, but we don't really have time for that. So I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come. And if you want God to either touch you with a compassion from him, if you want God to empower you, um, or actually if you want God to help you to understand his word, just respond to one of those three. And then we'll move, then we'll move into a time of uh, communion and receiving the bread of wine. So let's pray. Come Holy Spirit, we pray. We praise you that you're the living God. That the stuff we care about, you care about, but you care about more. Come, Holy Spirit, into our lives. And one of these is relevant to you, then just say amen in your heart. Lord, where we, we, we love to, to, to understand your word, not to beat people over the head with, but to understand you, Jesus, and your ways, and your ways for us. Lord, come, Holy Spirit, and help us to understand your Lord, we're just so heartbroken by the world that we see. Uh, Lord, and it seems just beyond us 
as individuals. It seems beyond us as a local church and beyond us as a country. And we pray, Lord, for you to give hope in our hearts and compassion. Not to burn ourselves out and kill us, but to love those that you want us to love. So guide us in that area of love. And Lord, we thank you for your power that changes lives. We don't simply have a faith of words, but of power too. And we pray that you would gift us with gifts of healing and gifts that set people free. Just come, Holy Spirit, and help us to be your people in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.